these are not nobody. How can you contribute to, to the community even if you're new? So yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience with Python Island and about well, Python in general. So join us, please. And then, no, no longer further, we are going to welcome Emmanuel Talev um, with his talk on the gentle touch of IPM, how code tracking works in Python. Welcome, Emmanuel. Thank you, thank you. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, so, let's, without, without further ado, I'll uh, jump straight in. Let me share. Uh, so, can you stop sharing your screen, Lise, so that it lets me do excellent. All right, there we go. Fantastic, all right, all good. So, um, my name is Emmanuel, and I work at Elastic, the makers of Elasticsearch, Kibana, Logstash, Beats, and various other open source projects. Um, so Elastic, in case you haven't heard of us, uh, it's um, a company that deals a lot with monitoring, and today the topic is related, uh, monitoring the performance of web apps. Uh, so let's, uh, let's see what... APM is. Oh, by the way, I'm in, uh, I live in London, but I really love Dublin and I love other parts of Ireland. Like I've been to Galway as well. Uh, like I really envy you people who uh, live in, it's just so beautiful. Shannon is good as well. I really need to go and visit the northern parts. So that's, uh, that's maybe a topic for after. Um, <clears throat> So the idea here with application performance monitoring, just to give you a quick overview of you know why might we even want, um, yeah, to why do we need anything beyond you know like looking at logs? So before APM, uh, typically the journey that most web devs take is they'll look at the textual output of their apps, so logging, and they might look at metrics. This is the journey that I took as well. Like when I first started putting web applications on the web, which was a long time ago now, uh, well, too long. But um, what you start with usually is you'll have maybe one machine and then you'll have everything on it. You'll have a data store and you'll have a web application, the actual one running, and you might have a web proxy of some kind or you know, like a, a web server like Apache or a proxy like Nginx. And um, uh, they all have a log and so you know when something breaks you can go in and you have a look and read the log and see yeah, what's gone wrong except of course that then you have to scale that out at some point uh, you maybe want them to be redundant and you end up with multiple containers or servers VMs as well virtual machines uh, that all have software that has logs and uh, so what happens is you know, what I've ended up in myself doing is uh, I had to at one point log into six different uh, virtual machines just to look at Elasticsearch nodes and their individual logs. At that point, you start thinking, well, you know, what, what can we do here um, to make this a bit easier? And so um, what I did was I just copied the logs all to my local machine. Uh, so in a way, that was centralization. Uh, but for the, over 20 years now, there have been better approaches, uh, such as the one on the screen. So there's uh, an old venerable project called Nagios, which allows you to uh, centralize the collection of both logging and metrics. And uh, there's others like Isenga is another one. And then um, there's so many nowadays. Um, Elastic is a, a company that makes some software for that. But the, the point here is that at some point, like the way I think of it, um, you start with, you run the web app, and then what happens, right? You have a need for information. Um, and so the need is like here. Um, and you want to know, well, what, there's an error on the screen. It's a 500. You can't show it to the users because of safety concerns. That you don't want to show them internal info and so on. But you also um, don't want to confuse them because this technical information you know, shouldn't be seen by random users who have no technical background. It'll just confuse them, scare them. 
Okay, right, so what do we need then? We need a place elsewhere, not the browser, to output this information. So you start outputting it to a log. Fine. But now let's say that the web app becomes sluggish and just like regularly you have some kind of problem with it. Often the culprit will be resources contention. So you have to go and look at uh, CPU contention or RAM contention. So this uh, something has been too full, has been used too much. Uh, we want to go and see. All right. So now we've we've so we're here. We've answered that question with logging, and now we've raised the bar again, right? And we have more need for information because we want to diagnose a more complex problem, and so we've answered it, that with metrics. So with APMs, as we want further information, and my personal story with that is that there was a time when I only I tried only using logs and metrics to solve a particular problem. Uh, a website of a client of mine was falling over regularly. Uh, it's about every five to six hours, uh, including during the night. And so and over the course of four days, I tried solving this with logs and metrics. It was very painful. And so instead, uh, what we ended up doing finally was installing an APM system. I was an Elastic APM, wasn't released back then. Uh, it was New Relic. And that really helped us see a lot more quickly what was going wrong, uh, where exactly was it going wrong, so with logs and metrics, it's still a black box. Like it's still what happens in the app itself is still a black box view. And so that's hence the need for APM. So I'm gonna talk, obviously gonna show you APM and so on. But just to give you a, a quick overview of what we're gonna talk about, um, uh, I'm gonna show you actually APM. Um, like Elastic APM, just, just a user interface. Uh, then we'll dive into like, why do we even have web frameworks in Python? And you'll see why that's relevant in a bit. Because uh, basically an APM system, in order to give you this white box view of what exactly is going on in an app, it needs to hook like, all the way down in order to uh, trace the stack trace. Um, so it's, it's sort of useful to know a bit about web frameworks. And then we'll have a look at the actual uh, Elastic APM code because uh, our agents are open source uh, as well as actually the server that collects the information. So it's all on GitHub where you can see all of this info and learn how it works uh, in depth. So I'll walk you through like, how it works. It's actually probably simpler than you might expect. And um, then we're going to have a look at visualizing traces. So I'll hear, I don't think I'll have time. Uh, it's judging by my prep for this talk for looking at exactly how they're visualized. I'm already giving you, going to give you a lot of tech detail. Uh, so uh, we're just going to, the visualizing will be okay. Right? That's what it looks like. It's just the end product um, rather than exactly how it's done. And then we're going to have a look at benchmarks and how we avoid causing a hit to performance, um, you know, which is a Again, surprisingly simple, actually. All right, so um, general, if you haven't heard of uh, the Elastic Stack before, Elasticsearch is an open source search engine. You can use it for a lot of things, lots of numbers, lots of text, and geographic information and search. And so because of that, it was difficult to come up with, OK, well, how do we make money out of this open source project? So there's a particular use case. Well, why don't uh, we let people put in lots of monitoring data like from web apps, because everybody needs that. And then hopefully we'll build some stuff that uh, you know, they're happy to pay us for. Um, so this is, by now, Elastic has uh, gone into security and mapping and uh, tons of other commercial areas, but monitoring is still a big one. Uh, so that's the stack. So today, the, this is the, the main projects, and they were gonna talk about one that sort of fits alongside those. Kibana is the graphical UI we'll be looking at. Elasticsearch is the underlying data store where all the data goes that we're gonna talk about. Uh, and that this is the only two we're gonna concern ourselves with. Okay, so APM that sort of fits alongside that. Where is like pizza logstash there for log processing and for metrics, so what we talked about earlier. Um, APM as software that sits alongside that. So you have um, an agent that you install in your app, sends information to a server, 
and that server processes the information, does some correlations, sends the data over to Elasticsearch, and Kibana reads the data from Elasticsearch in order to display it to you. That's the overall uh, architecture. So that's quite vague though, and uh, you know, technical people, so let's you know, talk more concretely. So this is how you do it in like a specific app. Um, so, and I'll show you one a bit later. So here we have a data store, we have a backend that will typically have a front end. Um, and so here is the agent as installed in the backend and uh, respectively the, re the RUM, real user monitoring agent, as installed in the front end. We started, I'm going to say we started at 40 past, <laughs> like the talk, um, and just to keep track on time. All right, so the agent uh, and the client site agent just send their information to the server, and that's uh, it goes to Elasticsearch, is read by Kibana. Right, so let's have a look then at the APM user interface. So. Second, that's the wrong uh, tab, but Zoom has conveniently positioned itself. Uh -huh. There you go, in the wrong place. Okay. All right, so um, that's kind of a full spread of what you'd see in production. That's a demo that that we keep. So this is quite typical of APM systems. If you use New Relic or Datadog or Elastic APM, you've seen stuff like this. Um, so the most important things here, you have uh, throughput, transactions per minute, and you have the duration of transactions. Uh, the fairly obvious here, the thing tries to tell you where you might have a problem, hence the red shading. Um, important concept here, I'll turn these two off. Um, so here, look at that. They, on average, the transactions take 369, actually, zoom in a bit, 369 milliseconds. Um, but 95th percentile, right? So you can see the top of the graph here is 2.4, and that's your average. And you turn on the 95th percentile, the, the top of the graph becomes 14 seconds. And that's quite close to 99. So the idea here is that those are samples so the, uh, the average, because you've got lots of fast transactions generally in the web app, the average might not show you um, a, a good representation of what the users are feeling. And so the idea is that 95th, 99 tell you what 95% of your users, 99 respectively, how your site might feel to them. And that does that by selectively sampling transactions. So basically sampling is, um, or the way we do it is we'll look at what are slower transactions and we'll try to track them more and to you know, take them more into account statistically. And so that's how we come up with that. Um, then you've got um, a list of transactions and the potential impact on your website. Um, we have a look at a particular one. Um, so this is the other thing APM systems are really famous for. If you haven't seen one, that's a breakdown of a transaction. So I'm just actually going to quickly also check chat. That. All right, okay. All right. Um, uh, <clears throat> so here we've got um, the uh, breakdown of a transaction and you can see that there's a full stack trace and like each function is sort of its own block and uh, including SQL queries. So in this particular demo is a Java app and we'll see a Python one as well. So we've got the some line, at like which line of the code issued the query. Uh, and yeah, so the different colors here are also worth uh, noting. Uh, so you've got, different services and this is called distributed tracing so the request filters from you know the front end so here you see it says react and blue uh, through to the back end which is javascript and uh, cyan and then through to further this back end service which is spring which is a java web framework and right? so 
Um, the request is tagged by the JavaScript APM client, and then the other APM clients that kind of preserve the tag and pass it on uh, and tag it themselves. And so then when the information reaches the server, this is correlated together. And then when Kibana, which is what I'm looking at, displays it, it shows it to you in different colors. Um, so distributed tracing is pretty cool. So you know, any service oriented or microservices architecture, obviously extremely useful to, to be able to see such a detail. Uh, excellent, okay. So that's a general gist uh, with like what an APM system is, just so that you've seen one. Um, so bear with, uh, with me, I'll try to keep this talk on the brief site, but it is the first time I'm giving it, so you know. Um, all right, so uh, with frameworks, um, what's the use of them? Uh, what have web frameworks ever done for us? What has the EU ever done for us? Um, the idea here is that there's a lot of boilerplate stuff, uh, URL routing, input forms, database connection management, uh, object ORM means object relational mapping. Um, there's just so much stuff that every web app needs to do when it wants to talk to other services or a database. And so it's just not every, if every dev had to do all of that themselves, we wouldn't get anywhere. Um, so that's their function, like, and that's how we all know them. But in particular here, I want to call out uh, something else. In doing these abstractions, um, there's uh, two further things that they kind of use in order to achieve these abstractions. Uh, one of them is middleware functionality. And middleware is the support basically for uh, code modules that are loaded and that execute for each request. And you can probably see where this is going with application performance monitoring, because if we execute for each request, then we can use that to trace each request or you have to do something else to each request. Uh, and something that's uh, is probably useful to know as um, you can't really talk the um, web server gateway interface, which is sort of a, a language or protocol and specific to, uh, well, it was specific to Python apps, maybe they're not anymore. And the um, idea here, oh, no, go on the next slide. The idea here is that they had like all of these frameworks. Um, and so they all needed a way to get their HTTP data out there. In the beginning, there was uh, an Apache module called Mod Python, uh, but that was just one specific implementation. So now if you've used you know, other web servers, we have Green Unicorn, uh, we have uh, Micro, WSGI, uh, yeah, we continue to have Apache, you know, so this, there's a lot of them. And so between all of the web frameworks and all the web servers, it became a bit, a bit of an explosion of possibilities to talk. And so that's why WSGI was born. Um, the idea there is that WSGI part basically deals with the scaling and the low level like talking to the browser and so on. Um, whereas we and monitoring uh, deal, like, we, we live in the web server part, right? So our app is taken, like, it's a Flask app for example, the app object is taken and, and given to Green Unicorn or whatever other WSGI compatible server you might have. Um, that deals with scaling and other low level stuff. We just deal with the business logic. Well, that's the idea. Uh, yeah, so this is a bit of a more philosophical slide on uh, how we even came up with web frameworks, but we're going to skip that in the interest of time. Uh, so, APM itself, right? So the idea here uh, is that you have these agents; they send this information to server, um, then gets visualized. It's pretty much the same for basic structure for all the vendors that are in the APM space. Um, Typically, they live inside your application. So usually, they'd be a dependency or at most a wrapper around it. Uh, so they would live uh, on the web server part. Right? So the WSGI server will take the APM part, which might wrap around your web app, and will run with that. Or if, 
the APM agent as a dependency, then that's just like well, that's just a library. Okay, so uh, they need to be language uh, and usually framework specific. Uh, otherwise, you need to do a lot of custom stuff. Uh, they collect um, performance data, obviously, as you saw, uh, and they also collect errors. Uh, that is something that you should see. So here is an example. Uh, I love this uh, because it's even if you already have logging, uh, it's a great like extra addition. And if you don't have good logging set up, it's amazing. So basically, it, it groups your errors. So if the same error repeats, you know, in a log, you just see it tons of times with the, all the stack trace. You know, so if this stack trace is in like 20 lines long, then I'd be seeing uh, like nearly 700, it'd be 740 lines of logs. But instead here, I just see like one line on the APM display and there's this many occurrences because they're grouped by the error. Right, so. That's, uh, and they, all of the vendors um, that I know of have this ability. So it's excellent. Like I would recommend just putting, if you don't have an APM, just putting one just for that, that you don't even have to look at the performance. If you're only using logging and metrics, just install one. Um, uh, yeah. No, so yeah, I should probably mention Elastic APM is free. So you can open it, obviously, being server and agents being open source. Um, the UI is not open source, but it is free to use without any limitations. And there's no trial, nothing. You can download all of the stuff, including uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, run it yourselves, or on Elastic Cloud. Um, you can also offload, like basically, the processing and the maintenance of running the software to us for a bit of money. And then you just send us the data. You just install the agents. Uh, yeah. And the other thing about APM agents is they need to have no overhead or little overhead on production because otherwise uh, people get pretty angry when you know, they're serving a million requests and you slow them down by 35%. That's a problem. Uh, so you need to avoid doing that. All right, so what you saw, so think back to the, uh, to the colorful blocks. What you saw there are spans and transactions. Um, so every operation that we trace as a span and uh, every transaction contains multiple spans. So like, for example, here, this update owner route, right? That's, well, that would be a route. And inside it, uh, like each request to that route will be a transaction. So here, you know, this blue uh, line, that's a transaction. Then that calls another service. That's also a transaction. See the little, the two arrows that are facing each other, that denotes a transaction. Then that transaction has a span, which is just one bit of it, uh, which is a put request to yet another backend service, which causes a transaction in that backend service. And then that transaction, you have uh, mo more spans. So here, you know, you've got a function, validate zip code, then after that, it executes uh, update owner, and that executes find owner by ID, and that executes a ton of queries. Uh, so that's the basic terminology, transactions and spans. And you, as you can see, there's different types. Like uh, SQL or just application code, all kinds of spans. All right, so basically the way they work is they'll wrap around each transaction and they'll measure the time spent on there. Um, and then they'll hook specifically into the, uh, uh, into the language itself and the framework. And now I wanna show you how? So we're going to look at a uh, Flask and Celery examples. Where did I find this? Yeah, okay, should be okay. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, really the meat of it. All right, okay, so uh, let's make sure I'm looking at the right stuff. Right, there we are. Okay, so I'm looking at the Elastic APM code base. This is on GitHub. Uh, do you, I think I didn't put it on the slides themselves, but I will put them on the last slide before I send you all the slides. And um, so you can read this stuff yourself. Quite interesting, actually. If you 
like we want to level up a bit as a Python dev, and you know you want to see how web servers work and how stuff is measured. That's quite uh, a good idea. That's it. Let me make sure you can read that. Okay. So this is the Elastic APM Python agent Flask integration. So that's how it's built. The agent has general measurement functions that have to be invoked specifically. And then for each framework, well, the, the module, the respective module, invokes those functions. Okay, some boilerplate stuff, creating stuff, and so on. All right, so handle exception. You know how we group the errors there? You said 37 occurrences of whatever error. That's how that works. All right, so that's what you saw on the screen as this function. Um, that gets called. Um, here we got the capture body, and that just sets it in errors. Uh, that can also put it in the headers. So, you know, like the actual HTTP headers, they're being passed from service to service. And that's how you can, um, you know, say you had a JavaScript exception, but then you know, how do you like capture that info uh, along the way so that it eventually makes it all the way um, back to, to the APM server. That's useful to put it in the headers. Uh, then, uh, right, so that's how errors get done. Right, and there are the hooks. Okay, actually, I just make sure that I do it again. Ah, there it is, yeah. So I wanna, you know, I don't wanna just show you like what the Elastic APM code is. I wanna show you like how it hooks into the uh, web framework. So this signals thing, right, that's the mechanism that Flask provides for us. So you can do that yourself. So you could write something like this that does something on every request. Uh, there's probably better ways of doing that in Flask, but if you particularly wanted to, it is possible. That's your hook, so that's how it actually works. Um, so you say, you know, on the request started signal that's issued by the framework, uh, you, we want to connect our request started function and the request finished, yeah, we have our own request finished function. And we also try to load to the Celery integration in case you're using Flask with Celery. And then furthermore, this is for the real user agent monitoring. Uh, so basically, um, if there are IDs coming back from the from JavaScript into Python, uh, this just makes sure that they're preserved. So there's a, a tiny bit of code to do that and preserve the information. Okay. Uh, so then here we've got the actual like, so that's our code, so that's Elastic APM now. Um, I mean, all of this is really, but this is sort of the meat of it, I guess. That's the bit that produces the little blue blocks and, and so forth uh, that you see. Oh, I get me on time. I guess, okay, excellent. Oh no, I got on the home, oh, Jesus. Okay, yeah, so 30 minutes. Right. <clears throat> yeah, first talk in the, uh, giving a talk, I'll, uh, I'll hurry it up. All right, so here uh, the begin transaction is uh, from there, capture that, and on we go. And so then eventually we just let Flask run. And that's, and the Flask calls it and it's done processing the request, you know, producing the HTML, doing the calls that it needs to do to the database and all of that, all of your logic, its logic, and all that afterwards. Uh, okay, and this function extracts the data from, uh, from the response. Right, so that's that part. Uh, now, oh, celery is simpler, don't worry. It won't take very long, there it is. Right. So in Celery, similar stuff. Uh, you have exception tracking. Uh, so yeah, basically, does you, is your background task erroring out? Is your bad job erroring out? Uh, very similar mechanism that Celery provides as well. They've also called it signals. 
uh, so just call right so register worker signals is our own function and um, these are the actual uh, like celery function names worker startup worker shutdown uh, and connect worker processes in it and this is uh, all of it actually so a uh, your if even if you're using a framework that we don't support, it's not that hard to add it. Um, I would, it will probably take you a while uh, just because of getting yourself familiarized. But if you want just basic tracking, you know, look at this module is less than 100 lines. Uh, and you get this you know, pretty colorful stuff automatically. So you just literally install it. And uh, I'll uh, I quickly show you how that like literally how do you use it so that you've got some idea and um, so you just put this dependency in elastic apm in this case is a flask app so i want extra please flask support if you please um literally two settings the name that you wanted to turn up as on the kibana ui that i was showing you and the server so where we're sending the events and then this wrapper around the flask app object that's it so you have that you do flask run or you give this um this app object to gunicorn you do your usual integration for running your app and that you don't have to do anything else you don't have to like go note specific functions whatever none of that it'll just show you that nice breakdown uh, Uh, okay, I do have a question. How does it compare to Prometheus and Open Tracing? So, Open Tracing is sort of a, a, a vendor collaboration project. Uh, well, sorry, Open Telemetry is. Um, yeah, we have Open Tracing, Open Census, which is kind of getting deprecated. Yeah, so, Open Tracing is also a cross vendor project. Um, and then, Open Telemetry is kind of the, the new thing. Um, can't see that question. So um, Elastic APM, uh, we, we always try to stay on top of cross vendor collaboration. So open collabs with uh, like, like open telemetry, uh, open tracing, we try to stay on top of them. Uh, open telemetry is still sort of, well, draft. So this, we can't see we're compatible because no one is, but we try to stay on top of that. And I uh, do have another talk and we're just like introduce what APMs are. And I there I, I always say, you know, when you're picking a vendor, do pick one that's uh, participating in cross vendor collab because it is important uh, for the sector overall. Um, yeah, I, well, Prometheus, I do, yeah. I guess, um, so Prometheus is just, it says for all sorts of metrics. You can also do app metrics in it. Uh, there are clients that you can install and it'll do similar things. I probably don't have time to answer your question in detail. And I also don't like, I, so, I don't really like comparing feature to, to feature, though I know that that's what you'd want. Um, because like uh, Elastic tries to build a whole platform that actually APM integrates with your logs and with your metrics. So if you're using Kubernetes, there's various integrations that you can click and you go from uh, APM transactions to related logs. And so it's also about sort of how it clicks together. Um, but through the open vendor collab, you know, you use a standard schema for storing the data so you can get your data out. And uh, of course, in the reality, that's not always as easy as, uh, uh, as, it, as just saying it. Okay. Right, so you've seen how to integrate it. Uh, you've seen like, the actual hooks. Um, so this is, so you know, like basically from, from here, right, from, from this bit, that then triggers uh, the Flask contribution part, right, so here, that triggers these things. I started request finish, init app, literally that bit there where I wrapped uh, the Flask app object in the APM um, constructor, this is what that calls, right? That, in turn, uh, does these requests, that does these signal registrations, and those, in turn, make sure that Flask will call 
these functions here, these two functions for start and end. And that is how we measure and extract data. That's it from, from you, what you put in the app down to our level. Uh, that I'd like to show you uh, on the Flask level as well, but yeah, it will be become a multi hour lecture. All right, so onwards. So that's the domain that I, that's how it works. Um, which I hope is interesting for you all, because I find it super fascinating, actually. Uh, and you've been kept kept up by, you know, at night by a feeling up, uh, eventually develop a perverse interest for understanding uh, why it's slow and how do people even figure out that it's slow. And it's actually quite clean, as you see. This hooks, language is ready for that, the frameworks are ready. Um, so yeah, it's a really good way to learn more about Python. Um, so Python, uh, so how do we do benchmarks? Oops, I gotta spend a lot of time on that. All right. So we're coming up on what, on 40, okay. Uh, so this is one way, just uh, load, gen this is all public by the way. Um, so you could, but it's probably better load testing tools, uh, load generation tools for you folks. Well, we've written our own tool um, and go. And if I show you, there should be a specific kernel. Uh -huh. Right, yeah, there it is. So that's it. I'll probably surprise you. And you're like, well, this makes sure that you don't hit production performance. Uh, yep, it does. So um, I'm not gonna like uh, go through it in detail, but what I'll show you is our own docs um, that I meant for, uh, Our devs, which should be uh -huh, yeah, this is what it does. So this you can relate relate to, right? I'm not just showing you random uh, random Python code that you don't have time to read. <clears throat> That's what it tries, and it just tries that loads of times. Because it is as simple as that, right? There's basic transaction types, there's errors. I, we are just a thin wrapper, right? If, if your app's slow, we're gonna measure that, but actually it's, it's pretty thin. And okay, maybe not simple, but n also not the most complex thing you've ever seen. Uh, uh, and so that's, that is how we avoid hitting production. And then there's more some more general integration tests, um, which are all in this public repo, uh, that just make sure that it all fits together. You know, so you have like client, and you have server, and you have real user monitoring, which is a different client, and you have to put it all together. It was done. All right, I'm uh, coming up very much on time. Okay, questions. All right. Um, all right. So that's it. Yeah, uh, that's simple. That, that's how we do our benchmarking because it is just a wrapper. There's nothing that magical about it. And um, yeah, there's other vendors that have some of their clients open source. I recommend looking at those as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit, uh, it's almost kind of addictive. It's, it's a really elegant part of the stack and you learn a lot about how um, like web frameworks work in general and how all of this stuff that you're using every day works. And that's a great way to go into it because you have the specific use case. You're not just like, oh, I'm just, you know, gonna sit here and twiddle my thumbs because I'm like filled with anxiety of whatever product feature I have to develop. Uh, I'm gonna learn um, how we measure, you know, how quickly this stuff goes. Uh, that, that's how I feel about it. Uh, so that's the, that's the end of it. <laughs> Bang on. Yeah, uh, 42, 42 minutes. That was amazing. I really, really, really enjoyed that. All right.
Fair I enough. did not imagine that, like, because I don't have that much experience. So I, but I struggle with log messages as well as I think everyone kind of does. Um, yeah. So yeah, you did get me thinking about all the log messages and all the VMs and how would you do to integrate them all. So that was, that was amazing. That was a pretty good introduction to the subject for me anyway. So I learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's just, yeah. I, I do want to add like, like, this stuff can also be totally useless, just like any other tool. <laughs> you know, you have like a log collection and whatever. I can be just a pretty dashboard full of graphs that nobody looks at. Um, you, like all of you, you know, like watching, like, you're the people who make sure, like you're in charge. These are just tools. And what I say, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but um, briefly, what I'd say is, review your needs regularly you know like you don't remember how i started in the beginning you have this need and so then we build the solution then you have this need so you build that solution or install it and etc cetera, etc cetera. so then you know when you get to, to the third step and you have apm or what have you uh you go back to it like every six months and ask yourself what problem did they have is it solved are there new problems as it still uh, serving me Right. And what else could I use? Okay. And you, so, can, you will think of compare pricing and all, all of that. So, sorry. So reassessment then. So reassessment is the key. Yes. So regularly reassess your monitoring. That's really the best way to keep it painless. Do it. Yes. Do it when it's not four days of debugging already, and you're at the <laughs> end of your wits. And yeah. Oh, wonderful. So well, I learned a lot. I learned. A, Really well. Thank you very, very much. And if anyone has any more, any further questions for Emmanuel, um, there is his email over there on the screen, and also his Twitter handle. Thank you very much for the great talk. Can you see? Thank you very much, Jacob, for your input. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that. Any questions? Any more questions? Dun, 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 dun. I had a question. Prometheus Open Tracing talked about that during the talk. Will I, there's a, there's a question, will I get the, the beer pint over to every speaker? Uh, you know what, when this is over, maybe I come over to, uh, to an actual session in Dublin and whatever, six, nine months, and uh, we'll see you all, all there. We're going to be more than happy to, hold, to have you here. Hopefully, like worst case scenario, can wait for you here in November because we have PyCon happening in November. Hopefully we have something working beforehand, but that will be November. You see, that will be a pint here with your name on it. <laughs> Do you drink Guinness? Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, this is the first beer I drank when I came to uh, like ten years ago. The oh, islands. So you're gonna feel at home then. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yes. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, you all uh, uh, stay safe. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, stay home, guys. And thank you very much. Hope to have you here soon again. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Lise.